All right, good morning, everybody. Um, by now, you know that uh, I'm home with COVID. And um, okay, give me a second here. I need to be able to. Okay, I can just do that. All right, so um, now I'm, I'm home with COVID. <clears throat> so it's going to, I don't know when I'll be back on campus. <clears throat> I have a feeling that uh, we'll be back to Zoom uh, on um, Thursday. I don't think I'll be back on campus, but uh, we'll see how that uh, goes. Keep an eye on your uh, emails, and then you'll know. Um, but we are going, I'm going to do a, a, a lecture for Chapter 34, and according to the email that you are going to receive from me, it's going to say that I am um, recording a lecture on Chapter 34. Uh, listen to the chapter. Uh, please uh, do uh, watch this uh, video, um, as I will do attendance from who signs up to watch this, because I can tell. Um, so anyhow, Chapter 34 bankruptcy. So bankruptcy is a federal law that um, really what it does is it, uh, um, it allows for the discharge of debt. Um, this is something that we find right in the Constitution uh, under uh, the powers and the enumerated powers of the federal government, whereas the power to create a system for the forgiveness of debts. Um, you have to uh, just take a look at why that would have happened. Um, if we look at the common law of England and the way that they handle debts, uh, basically, uh, if you owed money and you didn't pay the money back, you were arrested and you went to what was called debtor's prison. Um, we look at that now and go, well, gee, that was kind of backward. If you put somebody in prison, how are they going to make the money to be able to pay off the debt? Think we're, we're thinking back in terms of um, English law, you know, 1500s, 1600s, where people uh, didn't work in factories, they didn't punch time clock, they basically got their money from uh, working the land or from having rich relatives or friends that were willing to put their money together. So if you were thrown in jail, basically in, in debtor's prison, you basically weren't able to provide for your family. Um, and the you would then try to get the money, raise the money to get out of debtor's prison from your relatives or from your friends or from whoever uh, you could convince to pay you, uh, pay for you know, so you could get out of jail. So putting you in debtor's prison was a way of enforcing the debt. Uh, today's world, that really doesn't make any sense to us because we make our money from our jobs. If you put me in prison, how in the world would I get to my job? How would I be able to pay off my debt? Um, but the uh, uh, the founders uh, of, the, of this country and created the Constitution decided that, no, we're not going to have debtor's prisons here in America. We're going to have the ability to have a, re, a, a rebirth or a restart or a start over. Uh, that's what bankruptcy basically is. It's your ability to um, excuse me. It's your ability to uh, to get a fresh start um, if you uh, if you run into financial difficulties. So let's talk about three major types of bankruptcy. We're going to talk about Chapter 7 bankruptcy. We're going to talk about Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And we're going to talk about Chapter 13 bankruptcy. Um, chapter 7 is generally called uh, the uh, bank uh, li uh, liquidation. It's, uh, it's um, bankruptcy liquidation. So basically what's con what you do is you say, you know what? I'm insolvent, which means I have more debt than I have uh, more liabilities than I have assets, so I am insolvent. And you know what? There's no way I'm ever going to be able to pay these debts out. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, hey, you know what? I give up. It's now time for um, making sure of something here. Uh, I just give up. I'm, I'm going to go into the bankruptcy court and say, I'm going to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Here you go. Um, here's everything I own. Uh, just liquidate it, take it, pay off all my debt, off all of my uh, debts, and uh, please let me just start over. Okay, so that's the theory behind Chapter Seven. It's going to be a fresh start. We're going to get rid of all of the debts that you have, and we're going to um, basically um, 
just give you a fresh start. All of your debts will be forgiven, uh, but you end up starting with nothing. Okay, so uh, that's the theory behind chapter seven. Chapter 11 is what's called reorganization. Chapter 11 is where you go to court and say, if I only had an opportunity to try and restart, um, keep my debt, my creditors off my back for a little while, give me a chance to restructure my debt itself and be able to work some things out, I'll probably be able to, uh, uh, to make a go of this business. So please give me a chance. So chapter 11 is a way of reorganizing your company to try and work through your debts. You're not necessarily asking the court to take away all your debts, although we, you will find out uh, as we move through this that some debts are going to be forgiven. Most of the time, chapter 11 is used by companies. OK, as a as a means to try to get out of overwhelming debt and try and save the company to move forward, save jobs, save tax money, that type of thing. Um, chapter 13 is the third one we're going to talk about. And chapter 13 is what is called consumer bankruptcy. And consumer bankruptcy comes out of basically the abuse of the chapter seven process. So let's talk about the chapter seven process. I'll give you the way that it used to be in the, in the real world. Uh, the firm that I used to work with, uh, we did a lot of, of chapter, well, we did a lot of bankruptcy work. We had a very large bankruptcy department. We did chapter 11 reorganizations and such. We also did a lot of chapter seven uh, uh, individual liquidations. Uh, but in addition to that, one of our lawyers was a bankruptcy trustee. And it was his job to uh, sort of be the, uh, the, the judge in chapter seven bankruptcies. Now, uh, bankruptcy is all going to be under federal law. It's a federal law that creates bankruptcy at least the, you know, the process of bankruptcy. Uh, and there is a specialized court that is called the bankruptcy courts. Uh, it's not a article three court. So the judges are not lifetime appointees. Uh, so it's a, a court that is created by Congress, not the constitution. And as a result, the judges uh, serve 10 year uh, terms. They're not lifetime appointments. You, when you go into bankruptcy, I'll, I'll tell you about it, what, what it used to be because it's changed. Eh, it's not really all that new anymore. It's probably at least 20 years or so. Um, but uh, it used to be that when, at least when I was with the firm, okay, uh, what would happen is if you had somebody who wanted to, to declare chapter seven bankruptcy, you'd say, okay, that's liquidation. You ready to go through liquidation? And the whole theory here is, and everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to bring everything I own to the table, put it on the table, say, take it. Just let me go away free. Sell it. Pay what you can off uh, off my debts, and please just make it make it make it a, a fresh start. That's fine. But the problem is that as a society, we go well. Wait a minute. There's you know there's uh, let me see if I can even find this before I go too much further. Um, we don't want you to have to go through and start off with nothing. We're going to let you have some other things. We're going to let you keep some things. So there are some exemptions that you're allowed to have when you declare bankruptcy. And am I seeing them right here? No. Um, give me a second. I'll find it. So when you would go into chapter seven, uh, voluntary liquidation, what would happen is uh, you would be allowed to keep, okay, let me start with this. Uh, and I'm going kind of out of order on what you see on the outline, but there's something called the automatic stay. So when you would file for bankruptcy protection, the first thing that happens is uh, the law creates something that is called the automatic stay, which means everybody that you owe money to, they have to stop all collection actions. They're not allowed to. They're not allowed to sue you. They're not allowed to repossess any of your things. They're not allowed to call you to demand collect uh, demand payment. They have to stop all. Uh, collection activities against you. And so that's a really nice thing because you as the uh, uh, as the debtor, you get a, a breather. You can, oh, okay, now I can take a breath and I can try and figure out what's going on. Because see, the problem is, is that if you're 
really in bankruptcy, you're in some significant financial troubles. And then what happens is that you are so busy trying to dodge your creditors and try to stay uh, one step ahead of them so they don't take your stuff away from you that you can, you're just keeping, uh, keeping to try and uh, uh, have everything uh, stay. You don't want to lose your, uh, all of your property while you're trying to save your property. Um, that automatic stay is a tremendous, tremendous breather for you. Okay. So you get the automatic stay. Then what happens is you will then start to tell the court what you own. The bankruptcy petition has two basic things on it. It has a list of what your assets are, and it has a list of who you owe money to. OK, so we're going to start with the list of things that you own. OK, so. All right. So I own a uh, um, I own uh, the clothes that I have. Eh, bankruptcy court doesn't want your clothes there. Are any of them collectible things or like furs or anything like that? No, it's just clothes. All right, keep it. We don't we're not interested in it. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a carpenter and I have the tools that I use to uh, to to do my business. Oh, no, we want you to be able to work. So, no, we're not going to take your tools of the trade. You you just keep that. You know, we, we don't need that. Um, well, um, I have a car. Do you own the car outright? Or do you still own money on it? And that's an interesting question because it changes the way this is handled. But let's say that you own it outright. And it's only worth a couple thousand dollars. It's an older car and uh, it's worth a couple thousand dollars. Uh, the bankruptcy court says, hey, yeah, we're, we're not interested in your $2,000 car. You, you just keep that. Well, I've, I've got some jewelry. Uh, what's it worth? Well, it's a wedding ring and my wife's got an engagement ring and, you know, she, we've got some, uh, you know, some things. It's not worth just a few thousand dollars. And I'll, I'll keep your jewelry. We're not interested in that. Hmm. Um, I've got a house. Oh, you have a house. Well, do you own the house outright? Oh, no, no. I, I, I owe a lot to the bank. Okay. So, but do you have any, uh, uh, any, equity in it you know does, is it worth more than you owe on it well yeah yeah it is well how much well you know this is where it gets kind of interesting and i'm looking to see um, this chapter is not written very well um there's something called the homestead exemption i went too far um, the homestead exemption means that you're allowed to exempt uh, the equity in your house up to a certain value. Uh, principal exemption provided by the bankruptcy code are the debtor's interest in real or personal property used as a residence. The homestead exemption is now greatly limited and in effect preempts state law on this debtor exemption. Debtors are required to have lived in the home for two years prior to bankruptcy and the amount of the homestead exemption would be limited to $155,675. To be able to use a higher state homestead exemption, the debtor must have lived in the home for uh, 40 months. Um, so you're allowed to have $155,000 worth of equity in your home and the courts will say, yeah, okay, yeah, you can keep it. That's okay. Cause see the, the bankruptcy court doesn't want to take away your house. So, okay, wait a minute now. Now going into liquidation where I'm theoretically telling the court here, take everything I own and give it to my creditors and then give me a fresh start. And I'm telling you, well, the bankruptcy court's going to say, no, keep your clothes. No, keep your car. Uh, no, keep your jewelry, uh, keep your tools. Um, I, there's an exemption for life insurance or exemption for uh, medical equipment. There's an exemption for um, a few other things. But, oh, yeah, you're also allowed to keep $155,000 worth of uh, uh, equity in your house. No, wait a minute now. So I go into bankruptcy. I admit that I have all these things and a court says, yeah, no, don't, we don't even want to know about it. Do you have anything other than that? No, no, I, I'm just a normal person. I don't have a tremendous amount of money. I, I have those things. Court will say, oh, no asset bankruptcy then. No, I told you I had I had these assets, including $150,000 $150, worth of equity in my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those are all exempt. You don't need, you don't need to list them. So this is a no asset bankruptcy. 
Okay. So what was happening is people would run up debt. You know, what kind of debt are, were people running up? Well, a lot of people were running up credit card debts. They were buying things, you know, going crazy with their credit cards. And then all of a sudden found out they had hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of credit card debt. And they, they realized, oh, I'm allowed to keep just about everything I own as long as I do this the right way and file for a chapter seven bankruptcy. They got to keep everything they had and they got to just walk away from hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit card debt. Guess who didn't like this? The credit card companies. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't really care about the credit card companies because they made this problem for themselves, but that's their problem. I'm not, you know, I, I'm, the, uh, the court at that time said, oh, we don't care about that. That's fine. Um, but the, the credit card companies and the banks were able to get Congress to see that this was an abuse of the bankruptcy system. You had people running up huge debts, just buying things. We're not even talking about you know people who are down on their luck. There are people that were just abusing this system. And then they would just declare bankruptcy, keep all of their stuff, and then just wipe out all of their debt. And they were allowed to do this every six or seven years. It's like, oh, geez, this really sounds abusive. And it was. It was. Um, for people, lawyers that were in the bankruptcy business, it made uh, it, it was a, a, a neat way to make a few a few hundred dollars with uh, filling in some forms and not really doing a lot of uh, a lot of real legal work. Uh, it was a very clerical type uh, work if you knew how to do it. Um, uh, you may ask, well, geez, you know, don't we end up in court on all of this? Don't we have to explain to the judge uh, all this? Well, the procedure was like this. First off, in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, you don't get the judge. You're not important enough for the judge. The judge is dealing with those Chapter 13 cases and the more important large dollar ones. They don't have time for you. So what was happening is they would hire uh, specialists to come in as bankruptcy trustees. Generally, they were lawyers that knew a lot about bankruptcy. And in the firm that I worked in, we had a lawyer that did that. He was a bankruptcy trustee. So he got paid to administer these chapter seven bankruptcies. And he would have, he would go to the courthouse once, maybe twice a month, depending on how busy the court, the bankruptcy system was at the time. And he would hold his trustee hearings. He would stand in for the judge. How many times do you think you would end up ha to have to go to court in order to, to, to uh, achieve an, a, a complete forgiveness of your debt under chapter seven? Once. It's called the initial meeting of the creditors. You file the paperwork, you tell the judge all of the, you know, the court, all of the assets that you have, you tell the court all of the debts that you have, and then you say, please forgive me. Oh, by the way, I don't have any assets. Um, and then what would happen is you would get one court appearance and it would be in front of that trustee. And you would go in front of that trustee and the trustee would ask you, have you reviewed this paperwork? Yes. Is it accurate? Is it true? Or are you lying to the court? No, that's true. That's all of my assets, and those are all of my debts. You're willing to swear to that? Yes, I am. Okay, next case. All in all, it took about 40 seconds. Uh, the guy that I worked with, he would go through, I don't know, dozens of these in a morning because he basically gave you 40 seconds. You had to testify that, yes, everything was true, acknowledge that you didn't have any assets above what was exempted, and then he would just bang the gavel and send you on your way. He would rubber stamp your petition as being a no-asset case. And then what would happen is in 30, 30 or 60 days, uh, a, a final order would come through discharging all of your debts and uh, giving you the fresh start that you had asked for. So it was a very clerical uh, way of getting all of your debts to go away. Now, for people who had huge medical bills or things like that, it made a lot of sense. And it, it, yeah, I, didn't feel, I felt sorry for those types of people. They didn't have insurance. They ended up with a significant, a significant medical problem. And so they ended up going into bankruptcy to get out of the medical charges that they really couldn't afford. Okay, I, I, I felt for them. But people who ran up credit card bills, I can understand why the system all of a sudden rebelled against them. Um, so what happened was a Chapter 7 became known as being abusive. Okay, people were taking advantage of the system. So the banks lobbied Congress to change the bankruptcy laws, and they finally did. And they they put more emphasis on the chapter 13 bankruptcy, which is consumer bankruptcy. It's bankruptcy for individual people who um, 
are trying to get out of consumer debt. We're not talking about somebody who took out a million dollar loan to build a factory or no, we're talking about somebody who has normal consumer um, uh, debt problems, whether it's a medical bill or whether it's co uh, credit card bills or whether it's, you know, you, uh, you had a, a loss that was not covered by uh, some sort of insurance or whatnot. Just you ended up in a situation where you have more debt than you have the ability to pay. And you're, constantly being hounded by the people trying to get their money and it makes your life miserable. You can't get ahead because they keep trying to take your stuff away from you. You would go into uh, chapter seven and say, Hey, I want this to, to all go away. No, it's not going to happen now. Now there is something called a means test. What the court will do is they will ask you to put together a, not just a list of your assets and your, uh, your liabilities. Now they want to know what your income is. Because, see, the change that happened was when uh, when the banks forced the, uh, the the Congress to change the bankruptcy rules, they made Congress and the bankruptcy courts realize that the largest asset that you have is your ability to make money. Your ability to work is worth more than anything else you own. So they started taking that into account as an asset in consumer bankruptcy uh, cases. So in addition to telling us about all of your assets, <clears throat> we want to know all about what kind of money do you make? What kind of money are you going to be capable of making? So now what happens is the a court requests that you put together a plan. If you had the ability to not uh, have people trying to take your stuff away from you for the next four years, if we were to take your income and divvy it up among the people who you owe money to, would we be able to get them paid off? And so then what happens is you put together a plan, show what your earnings are going to be over the next four years. And then if you have enough earnings in there that if you weren't constantly being badgered by these people and being hit with late fees and, and having to defend yourself in legal court cases and whatnot, that you'd be able to pay your bills, <clears throat> then the court will say, okay, you're going to go into chapter 13 bankruptcy. So chap chapter 13 bankruptcy is the new version of chapter seven. It doesn't allow you to abuse the system. Uh, it recognizes that your um, biggest ink, your biggest asset is your ability to create income. And then you use that income to pay your bills over a period of time, according to a plan that you file with the bankruptcy court. So in theory, the way this works is that the, the bankruptcy court will look at the amount of money you make. It will allow you an allowance to pay for things like housing, gasoline, car payments. If you need to have a car to get back and forth to work, rental, you know, those types of things, they give you an allowance. And then they say, all right, the rest of that you give to us and it all gets paid to the bankruptcy court. You're basically being put on a budget on an, on an allowance, if you will, a bankruptcy court collects all of the rest of your money and then they pay it to your creditors over that four year period. So once the four years is over, whatever has been paid off is now done. Okay, so if you had enough money to pay off your debts completely, then you're out of debt because you paid off your debts. You just had some help with the bankruptcy court keeping the people off your back. But if you've paid off, say, 80% of your debt by using your income for that four-year period, then at the end of the plan, whatever debt remained unpaid would then be forgiven. A big difference from the original Chapter 7 stuff where you walk away with all of your assets and all of your debt just goes away, you know, snap your fingers and it's gone. Uh, this Chapter 13 takes four years and it takes basically a huge chunk of your income over that th uh, four-year period and a lot of money gets paid against your debts. So the creditors make out a lot better in a Chapter 13 bank 
bankruptcy than they would in a Chapter 7. Chapter 7 still exists. You just have to have uh, debts that are just way too large to be able to be paid in, in any significant way by the income that you have. You may not have the ability to make income. Let's say that you were disabled and you don't have the ability to, to work. You're going to get some sort of disability pay, but it's not going to be enough to pay off your debts. Yeah, you still will be able to go into Chapter 7 then. But Chapter 7 is a lot less common than it used to be. All right, let me move back in the chapter where I think I need to be here. Okay. Um, according to the book, Chapter 7 Bankruptcy, available to individuals, partnerships, corporations, <laughs> farmers, insurance companies, and other types of businesses not entitled to Chapter 7 bankruptcy covered by other statutes. <laughs> uh, under the BAPCPA, we talk about needing to go into Chapter 13 instead of Chapter 7. Reorganization under Chapter 11 bankruptcy is a way for a debtor to reorganize and continue a business with protection for over overwhelming debts without the requirement of liquidation. Uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. But Fuddruckers, Chicago Cubs, Chrysler, General Motors, Sharper Image, United Airlines, and Delta Airlines, all companies that have gone through Chapter 11, bank, uh, chapter 11 bankruptcies. Okay, let me move forward in the book here just a bit. All right, declaring bankruptcy. Um, I don't know how many of you are uh, fans of the television show, The Office. There was an episode where Michael was talking to Jim about all of his financial woes. Or no, he's talking to Oscar. And Oscar said, he says, Michael, you need to declare bankruptcy. You're, you're in such terrible shape. You need to declare bankruptcy. So Michael went out into the middle of the sales floor and he stood on top of a desk and he raised his arms above his head and he says, I declare bankruptcy. Is that how it's done? No. Uh, you declare bankruptcy by filing the paper, the paperwork. There's a, about a 12 page form that you have to complete and then you have to pay a couple hundred dollars, I think, to file it at the federal courthouse with the bankruptcy court. <clears throat> that is filing bankruptcy. OK. So that's how you and there's two types of bankruptcy. There's voluntary bank bankruptcy where you decide that you want to declare bankruptcy because you're tired of the fight. Uh, and there's also something called involuntary bankruptcy, where the um, uh, the creditors can get together and decide they want to force you into bankruptcy. So one of your creditors will file the paperwork to drag you into bankruptcy. Why would they do that? Well, what's going to happen is if you have a lot of different people that you owe money to, if you are not in bankruptcy, there's no structure as to who gets paid. And so... Um, the creditors may want there to be the structure of the bankruptcy court so that everybody gets their fair share of your body and bones when they tear you apart to, you know, to pay off your debts. Um, if you're not in bankruptcy, then, you know, it could, it, it could be this really mad dash to the courthouse and a flurry of lawsuits and a haste to make sure that uh, somebody gets the first lien against you because first in time, first in right. Remember, talked about that last chapter. Okay, so uh, those types of things. Uh, the book talks about what the actual uh, means test is to make sure you can, you can go into chapter 13 as opposed to chapter 11. You can look at it if you want. I'm not going to ask you that. It's not enough for my purposes that you know that that is where we are. That's what the, what the law is at this point in time. Um, okay, involuntary is on the next page. Um, Number of claims and petitioning creditors, that's involuntary. You're not going to worry about it. Hey, I talked about the automatic stay. Uh, just the filing of either a voluntary or involuntary petition operates as an automatic stay, uh, which prevents creditors from taking action, such as filing suits, foreclosures uh, against the, uh, uh, the debtor. The, the stay freezes all creditors. Uh, in their filing date position so that no one creditor will gain an advantage. Everybody has to stop. And if you have a creditor that has not stopped and continues to try to aggressively co collect the uh, 
uh, the debt from you, you can go to uh, the bankruptcy court and the bankruptcy court will give them a, uh, uh, a stern talking to as to what the what the actual meaning of the automatic stay is. Creditors can get yelled at by the court. Um, okay, involuntary. I'm not going to worry about involuntary anymore. Administration of the case. I'm not really super interested in making sure you know anything about that. Uh, order of relief. Uh, who gets paid? Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Order of relief. <laughs> That's the order that comes from the court. Granted by the bankruptcy court and is the procedural step required for the case to proceed in bankruptcy court. Keeping moving along here. A list of creditors. You have to make a list of your creditors and tell the court how much you owe them. Uh, there's a discussion in a chapter about the trustee. I already talked about the trustee. Uh, the bankrupt's estate. In many cases, when a debtor knows that insolvency is a problem and bankruptcy is imminent, the debtor may do some bad things. He may attempt to hang on to property or reputation by making transfers of assets to friends, relatives, and creditors. However, trustees have the authority to set aside or avoid certain types of transfers. Look at it from this point of view. You're an individual. You've got a business that, you know, the sole proprietorship that you thought was going to be the best thing since sliced bread. So you start this business. You go to your mother and ask her for $10,000 to help you start this business. She gives you the money. Now you have a lot of other creditors out there. Your business has been running for a year or so, uh, but you have trade creditors out there. You've got banks out there. Let's say you owe other people around $100,000 and you go, oh my God, I I can't get out of this. These these I, this business is terrible. I'm never going to make enough money. I need to declare bankruptcy. So you owe the banks. You owe your trade creditors. You owe other. You owe your employees a hundred thousand dollars. You owe your mother ten thousand dollars. And let's say you have fifteen thousand dollars in the bank. What are you going to do? Most of us would write our, our mother a check for $10,000. Because, hey, my mom gave me that money in good faith, and she should get it back. <laughs> well, the bankruptcy court disagrees with you. Okay? Trustees have the authority to set aside or avoid transfers by the debtor uh, that a creditor holding a valid claim under state law could have avoided at the commencement of the bankruptcy case. Preferences, that is, transfers of property by the debtor to a creditor, the effect of which is to enable that creditor to obtain payment of a higher percentage of the creditor's claim than the creditor would have received if the debtor's assets had been liquidated in bankruptcy. Uh, statutory liens that become effective against the debtor at the commencement of the bankruptcy. So basically, if you pay somebody that you shouldn't, mom is not a preferred creditor. She's not somebody that the court says you should pay first. Um, so if you give mom that money, the uh, the trustee, when he finds out about it, when you actually do file for bankruptcy, he's going to go knocking on mom's door and say, oh, by the way, you owe us $10,000. And yeah, I Believe me, I know you don't want to put your mother into the situation where you're going to end up declaring bankruptcy and not paying her the $10,000. Uh, if you give her the $10,000, then it's going to be the embarrassment of the court coming and asking for that money. You really don't want that to happen either. Okay, voidable preferences. Um the debtor may not transfer property, prevent creditors from satisfying the legal claims, um, avoid any such transfer as a fraudulent transfer. So basically, you were pretending to sell it to a friend of yours or another relative, uh, but it was not really a legitimate transaction. The court will step in and uh, reverse those transactions also. For it to be a preferential transfer, um, it has to have... When the transfer was made to pay a debt incurred at some earlier time. The transfer was made when a debtor was insolvent and within 90 days before the filing of the bankruptcy petition. And the transfer resulted in the creditor receiving more than the creditor would have received in a liquidation of the debtor's estate. 
you're presumed to be insolvent on and during the first, the 90 days immediately preceding the filing of the bankruptcy petition. So if you make a transfer to mom within that 90 day pri period prior to filing for bankruptcy, the court's going to go back after that. Uh, sometimes the courts require that the, cre the creditors file with the bankruptcy court something called a proof of claim. I don't usually, <clears throat> I didn't used to see those in Chapter 7 cases, but in Chapter 11 cases, they are absolutely required. So there's a paper for you to file if you are owed money to confirm to the court that, yes, you are owed money. Priorities. So one of the things that happens in bankruptcy is all about organization. Okay, we want to get people paid in an organized manner. So there's a priority as to who gets paid in what order. Okay, so priority claims. Creditors who hold security for payment, such as a lien or a mortgage. So remember last chapter, we were talking about secured debt. <clears throat> if you are a secured creditor, then the, uh, uh, the, because you went through the process of becoming a secured creditor protects you. You're allowed to take that asset. Now, because of the automatic stay, you're not allowed to take it without asking permission from the court. But ultimately, because you hold that lien, that security interest, if it's been perfected properly and such, then you get to take whatever you have as collateral. Now, one of the interesting things that will happen here is let's say that uh, – um, there's $10,000 worth of collateral. Let's say it's those uh, gold coins that I'm holding, but you owe me $15,000. Eventually what will happen is I'll be allowed to take the $10,000 and liquidate it so that I can get myself paid. So since I have a secured interest in those gold coins, I'll keep them. I'm a secured uh, creditor, so I get my money. But I only get my money that uh, the... Uh, so security gives me. So if I'm owed 15, but I have $10,000 worth of collateral, then I'm secured as to $10,000. I'm an unsecured creditor for the other five. So uh, I would then be treated as both a secured creditor and a non-secured creditor. Uh, here's the priorities according to the law. Allowed claims for debts to a spouse, former spouse, or child of the debtor for alimony, maintenance, support uh, of a spouse or child <clears throat> that were in effect at the time of the bankruptcy petition. Costs and expenses of administration of the bankruptcy case, including fees to trustees, attorneys, and accountants. Number three is claims arising under the ordinary course of a debtor's business or financial affairs after the commitment commencement of the case. Uh, four, claims for wages, salaries, or commissions. Uh, five claims arising for contribution to employee benefit plans based on service rendered within 180 days prior to the filing of the petition. Farm producers um, who uh, you know, grain storage facilities claims by consumer creditors not to exceed 2775 for each claimant arising from the purchase of consumer goods when a property or services were not delivered. Certain taxes and penalties due to the government, all other unsecured creditors. Number nine, all other unsecured creditors. Ten, tort claims for death or personal injury resulting from operation of a vehicle while intoxicated. Number 11, anything else will go back to the debtor. So if you're unsecured, you're ninth in line. Each claim level must be paid in full before any lower claim level is allowed to have anything. Okay. All right. Okay. We already talked about the exemptions. Understand that the exemptions that you're allowed, I had talked about them when I was talking about chapter seven and the abuses there. Um, there are actually two different sets of exemptions. You can choose to use the federal exemptions or you can use the state exemptions. The states are allowed to set their own exemptions for uh, the federal bankruptcy purposes. So this, your state may have a much more liberal uh, version of the exemptions, and in which case you would elect to use the state uh, exclusions. Pennsylvania uh, does have 
some uh, state exclusions, but they're not as generous as the federal exclusions. So generally, if you're going to be filing for bankruptcy in Pennsylvania, you tend to use the federal exemptions. Um, I have listed on the outline there that the homestead exemption is something separate. Uh, the whole idea behind uh, the new homestead exemption, like I said, it was a limited to $155,000. Um, anybody ever hear of OJ Simpson? Yeah, O.J. Simpson, uh, he was found innocent of killing those people that he killed. I mean, that he was accused of killing. Um, but later on, he was sued civilly for their deaths and he lost um, because you're allowed to sue civilly when you've, you know, because it's a different standard. It's not double jeopardy. Uh, so the people, the families of the people that O.J. Simpson killed uh, were allowed to sue him for wrongful death, and they got judgments of a gazillion dollars against him. So the families moved to try and seize all of his property. One of the things that O.J. Simpson did in the process when he knew all of this was going to happen was he changed his residence from California to Florida. Because at the time, Florida had an unlimited um, homestead exemption in the uh, bank in its bankruptcy exemptions okay so what oj did was he took every penny that he had and he put it into the home that he bought in florida and then when the uh, families came after him to try and seize his property they were able to get some bank accounts they were able to get his uh his uh, uh, sports memorabilia and all that type of stuff but they couldn't get at the majority of the bulk of his assets because he had sunk it into a massive uh, home in Florida. And under Florida's bankruptcy exemptions, it was an unlimited homestead exemption. So he was able to cheat the system by putting all the money into the house. Uh, that didn't sit well with a lot of people. And there's a lot of other celebrities that did the same thing. If you want to read the chapter, there's a whole lot of stuff. Um, we've got... Um, Corporate Raider Paul Bozarian, we've got Burt Reynolds, we've got um, Wendy Graham from Enron's board, Phil Graham. Um, there's, there's a lot of people that did this. So the gov government said, reacts, because that's what the government does, is it reacts to things it considers is wrong. It said, wait a minute, now we can't have that happen. Let's, uh, let's limit the homestead exemption on the federal level. So it doesn't matter what the state says, the federal exemption for uh, the homestead exemption is now the law of the land. Um, discharge in bankruptcy. That's what you're looking for. You're actually looking for the court order at the end of bankruptcy. So in, at the end of a chapter seven bankruptcy or at the end of a chapter 13 bankruptcy, you're going to get a court order that says that you have been discharged, meaning all of your debts are gone. Anybody that you owed money to is no longer entitled to collect that money. They're, the debts have been set to zero by the bankruptcy court. And you'll have a court order that says that, that you're being discharged in bankruptcy and all of your debts are hereby forgiven. Nice of the government to forgive you. I'm sure that the creditors are not as happy about that. You can be denied discharge. The court will refuse to grant the discharge if the debtor has. Within one year of the filing, fraudulently transferred or concealed property, trying to hinder, delay, or defraud, failed to keep financial records, made false oaths or accounts, <clears throat> failed to explain satisfactory any loss of assets, refused to obey any lawful order of the court and refusing to testify after having been giving, given, given immunity. Um, obtained a discharge in the last eight years, filed a written waiver of discharge that is approved by the court, or in the case a consumer debtor has failed to complete a personal financial management instruction course. So they want to make sure that you are uh, educated as to how bankruptcy works and uh, admit that, you know, you're not taking this lightly, that this is a big, uh, a big deal. Okay, certain types of debts are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Uh, following debts are not dischargeable by bankruptcy. Loans obtained by the use of fa uh, false financial statements. <coughs> debts not scheduled or listed with the court in time for allowance. 
debts arising from fraud where the debtor was acting as a fiduciary by reason of embezzlement or larceny, alimony or child support, a judgment for willful or malicious injury, consumer debt to a single creditor totaling more than 650 for luxury goods or services from within 90 days of the order of relief. This is the luxury goods thing. I'm going to go out and, and, and uh, buy something that's going to f uh, fit into one of the exemptions that's considered to be a luxury. Damages arising from drunk driving or operation of a vessel or aircraft by law inebriated. Loans used to pay taxes, including credit cards. Taxes uh, paid as a result of a fraudulent return, although un other unpaid taxes by beyond three years can be discharged. Pre-bankruptcy fees and assessments to homeowners associations. Debts owed to, uh, to tax-qualified retirement plans. Uh, taxes within three years of bankruptcy, liability for obtaining money for property by false pretenses, willful and malicious injuries, debts caused by DWI, <coughs> alimony, maintenance, and child support, unscheduled debts, debts resulting from fraud or fiduciary, government fines or penalties. Number nine is the one you need to know. Educational loans due within seven years unless undue hardship. So you can't go through school, build up your, your educational debts, your student loans, graduate, declare bankruptcy, and then say, Hup, don't have to pay any of those loans back. So nope, student loans are specifically excluded from discharge in bankruptcy. All right, the last thing that I have on the agenda here on the outline is uh, reorganization plans under chapter 11. And then I also have chapter 13 here. We talked about chapter 13. Basically, we're going to use your income to uh, uh, to pay off your debts over a four-year period. Reorganization doesn't take uh, a long time. It takes a long time to create the plan, but it when it is approved, it goes into effect immediately. And there's no three, four-year period where things get paid. Basically, what's going to happen is if you're a large business, uh, you're going to declare bankruptcy under Chapter 11 and ask for the protection of the courts. What that does is it keeps your creditors from shutting down your business while you're trying to figure out a way of staying in business. The automatic stay will protect you for a little while. But you have to start working on putting a plan together. Now, normally what's going to happen is you have a lot of debt that is really hurting you. And your debt service is making it so that you don't have the ability to grow your company. You basically are in some sort of a, a business cycle where all of your cash <clears throat> is going into paying your debt. And it's, it's tough for you to make a profit. You made a bunch of bad decisions to get here, of course, but uh, now what's going to happen is you're going to want to try and redo your debt. Now, you're going to have a combination of secured debt and unsecured debt, okay? The secured debt, the secured creditors, they're sitting pretty. They don't have to do anything for you. They know that they're number one. They are allowed to take their, their uh, collateral anytime they want. Uh, you really can't do much with them. You can't threaten them. Um, you can hopefully, if you believe you have really bad uh, terms of lo of your loan, you could then make the, uh, uh, you could try to renegotiate the loan. It's unlikely that the bank will give you better terms. Why would they? But you might be able to find a bank that wants to take that other bank's position. So they'll pay off the bank with the with the secured interest. But then, of course, the new bank is going to be uh, secured. You could do that as part of a reorganization. Uh, but the biggest thing that happens in a re well, yeah, you do that. You do a lot of bank shuffling in a reorganization. But the other thing that happens is you talk to your unsecured creditors and you go, you know, if we were to go through Chapter 7, you know you'd get nothing, right? So here's what's going to happen. In our plan of reorganization, we're going to give you 10 cents on the dollar. And the unsecured creditors will be up in arms. That's crazy. No, why would we ever agree to that? As a matter of fact, the procedures allow for a uh, committee of the uns, uh, the unsecured creditors that uh, the that has a lot of power in the bankruptcy proceedings. Um, but ultimately, the rule only says that they have to receive more in your plan of reorganization uh, than they would have under liquidation. <laughs> So, so if in liquidation they would get nothing, 
If you're planning on giving them 10 cents on the dollar in your reorganization, you comply with the law. They're not going to agree with this uh, um, willingly. They're going to try and negotiate for a higher number that they get paid. Now, remember, you have to find the money to pay these people because in order to get out of bankruptcy, <clears throat> in order to start the reorganization, come out the other end, you have to pay these people at the end of the bankruptcy. So you got to get the cash somewhere. This is where you might be able to find some lender that's willing to give you a loan to pay them off. But, you know, that's not going to be really great terms. Understand that. But, hey, really poor terms for a loan that 10 percent of what you actually owed to everybody else is maybe not a bad deal. So it's called um, uh, it's called ramming it down their throats. <laughs> so basically, uh, if you decide, no, I can only afford to give you 10 percent and the uh, creditors, the unsecured creditors uh, refuse that, then you go to court and then you, you know, you just ram it down their throats and you, you get the, the court to adopt your plan with them getting 10 cents on the dollar, which is generally what happens unless you have somebody that's like not really needs to be in bankruptcy. But everything I've seen, that's where it ends up. Um, so. The, the court will issue an order that they're going to end up with their 10, 10 cents on the dollar. You get that money from somewhere. You come out of bankruptcy paying that 10 cents on the dollar for your unsecured creditors, having refinanced uh, all of your secured debt. Maybe you've got a little bit of cash flow now so you can go out and buy, uh, buy inventory because Christmas is coming. And then hopefully you're going to have a really great Christmas and you'll be able to make some money and then get back on your feet and, and be able to continue as a business. Uh, the other thing that happens in a Chapter 11 reorganization is that the company has the ability to revoke contracts. Now, when we talked about contracts, remember one of the things I had talked about was whether a contract was executed or executory. Executed meant the contract was completed. All of the promises had been met, had been completed. An executory contract means that not all of the promises had yet been performed. It means we're still waiting for something to happen. Okay. In bankruptcy, the uh, the bankrupt entity in chapter 11 has the power to rescind or revoke executory contracts so if the contract hasn't been completed and it's not going to work to the bankrupt company's advantage they'll just revoke the contract um, the names that i had given at the beginning of the chapter a couple of them were airlines so what had happened uh in the uh, uh days after 9-11 where the 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 uh, uh, airline industry was really hit hard, people stopped flying. They lost a lot of money. Uh, a lot of the bank, a lot of the uh, uh, airlines were went into bankruptcy, and they went into bankruptcy. Yes, to re uh, to re uh, realign their debt, but a lot of them went into bankruptcy so that they could revoke their executory contracts, which were the union contracts with their uh, their flight attendants, their mechanics. And their pilots, because uh, they were they were required to pay everybody at a certain level, and they didn't have the money to pay those people anymore. But under contract, they had to. But by going into bankruptcy, they could revoke those union contracts and renegotiate them at a different price. Um, so, Chapter Eleven bankruptcy is uh, it gives you you know first off the automatic stay. It gives you the ability to refinance some of your debts. It gives you the ability to do a cram down on the unsecured creditors, and it gives you the ability to revoke um, contracts that are not uh, beneficial to you. Uh, so those are the tools that you get when you are using a Chapter Eleven bankruptcy. Um, there's a discussion about what's in the plan here in the chapter. If you want uh, confirmation of the plan, it has to be confirmed by the court. Um, generally, the all the various committees have to agree. Payment plans under Chapter 13, we had talked about that. <clears throat> the individual's debtor plan is in effect a budget of the debtor's future income with respect to outstanding debts. The plan must provide for the eventual payment in full of all claims entitled to priority under the bankruptcy code. All creditors holding the same kind or class of claim must be treated in the same way. All creditors having priority. So non-priority creditors may end up being forgiven. And I think that is the end of the chapter. So, um, 
hopefully you picked up what chapter uh what uh con what um bankruptcy is for our purposes if you look at the outline you see that i make a big deal out of chapter 7 chapter 11 and chapter 13 read the sections of the chapter that uh, re reference to each of those there are many other different types of uh, of bankruptcies out there um, and they are the other chapters in the bankruptcy code those are the big three that you will see uh, most common, you know, uh, chapter seven bankruptcies for liquidations. Yes, they still exist. Chapter 13s are much more prevalent now, but chapter 11, we have the big companies that are trying to stay in business. They will do their chapter 11s and try. Understand uh, uh, that it's voluntary or involuntary and understand what the automatic stay is. Uh, know that there are avoidable transfers. You can't do crazy things to try and prefer one creditor over another as you go into bankruptcy. There's a priority as to who gets claimed. Remember that the debtor has exemptions when they go into creditor, when they go into bankruptcy. Um, you want to get a discharge. Understand there are some debts that are just non-dischargeable with student loans being the big one on that list. Okay. All right. So let me get some of this stuff off my board here. Um, that's all I have. Uh, that's chapter 34, bankruptcy. Um, right now, it's my intention to probably do Thursday as a Zoom class. Um, I don't know that I'll be able to be back on campus, campus yet because uh, at this point, uh, although I'm on the mend, I still have COVID. Uh, my wife has still has it has, it came down with COVID after I did. So uh, there's COVID in the house. So um I will, you know, I'll post this. You, you're, you're seeing this, so you know it's posted. So uh, uh, watch your emails for what's uh, going to happen with regard to uh, Thursday. All right, thanks. We'll talk to you later.